Common Sense with Junior Doan, sharing the wisdom and insight of those who have been there and done that. Hello everybody and welcome back to Uncommon Sense and a special welcome to those of you who are tuning in for the very first time. This is a chance to be together, to relax, and hear from real people about life, particularly their life. With me today is Howard Bentray, an artist I've admired for some time and known for a little bit of time. It's the artistic impulse and the, the um, ability to become an artist different, in your opinion, from becoming a doctor. What do you need to know as an artist? Well, you know, I, I, would, I, I would say that there are some aspects that are different and, and, and some aspects that are the same. And um, I think that we were saying a little bit earlier is that I don't know that you really can teach somebody how to be an artist. I mm -hmm. think you can teach them techniques. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you can teach a doctor techniques. Mm -hmm. And a doctor, if they've learned their techniques well, can do what you want them to mm -hmm. do, which is repair your broken arm very well. But when you're an artist, even if you learn the techniques of painting or making sculpture, because you reproduce the techniques does not necessarily mean that you're putting in that other quality. How do you get in touch with that creative moment or you know, impulse? That's an it's an interesting thing. Um, at a certain point, I just learned how to trust myself. Because I would say, for me, my work is a combination of intellectual, spiritual, and emotional. And so I'm a very rational person, and I think a lot about concepts and how to make those concepts in the sculptures. But at the same time, I'm also just trying to be in that moment when I can feel what it should look like or be like or how it can express what I'm trying to express. And that's an intangible. And that's not the thing I think you can teach. Is it dependent on schools? who you're with? Uh, Whether it's a client or a fellow artist? You know, most of those moments happen privately in my studio. Mm -hmm. They don't happen in the public. In solitude. They happen in solitude. And one of the things that's been difficult for me to learn how to do, and I've been working as an artist out of school for 25 years, um, was I have a number of assistants in my studio. And I had to learn at a certain point how to be so much in myself that they weren't even there. Hmm. And, they, and now, they, they, you know, they know if the music's on and I'm drawing, they just know don't, it's not a moment where they should ask me a question or... How do you keep yourself fresh? Well, that's an interesting one. Um, well, one of the things I have always said, if when you go and you start to draw and you know what it's going to look like when you're done, it's time to change your work, <laughs> okay? Right. So for me, it's a constant exploration of my ideas, my interests, and of course, as you get older, those interests change, the way you look at life changes, and that if you're willing to take risks on incorporating and being expansive, then your work will change. You know, one of the things I also am interested in is, uh, you know, uh, when I work with a, let's, a client, most of which who become friends, um, yeah. you know, I, I never, I'm always looking for some new, something, op opportunity, something I haven't done before, something that'll take me in another direction. Mm -hmm. So that's another way is that, um, you know, our experience together is, well, sure, now let me see, how, how, how do I incorporate that into mm -hmm. the way I see the world? 
Mm -hmm. What does grandiose mean to you? Grandiosity in an artistic sense. You just hmm. mentioned that. Uh, I did? Expansive. 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 Well, I, I think it means being open. Mm -hmm. it, it means expanding your universe, looking out as well as in. I mean, there are a lot of people who, who are kind of constantly shutting down because they are of fear of being out in the world or letting the world's experiences come into them. And that's, I'm just, my personality is not that. My personality is to be an expansive person and to be out in the world and to take things in. I mean, we have this beautiful day. We have this beautiful yeah. walk. Right. I mean, you know, this to me. So, yeah, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and I drove up here, but that was great. To me, that I knew something would come out of today. When you um, um, have something untoward happen into your, in your mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. how do you think it through? What do you do with it? How do you handle it? Well, something unexpected that uh, you wish hadn't happened. Well, you know, I had some very early on tough experiences. My mother died when I was 13. My father died when I was 18. So um, I formed some opinions about life fairly mm. early on, which was that today could be the last day, so it's important right. to enjoy it. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know? And, and to do the things that you feel will make you happy and that you, you need to do for yourself in life. Um, and I've had other things that have happened through the course of my life, and what I've decided to do is look at them and see what I could learn from them. That, that things happen, um, and then bad things happen to everyone. Mm. It's not that bad things happen, it's what you do yes. with that experience. Yes. And so that's sort of, not to be too philosophical, but, right. but that's been my philosophy is I've looked and um, I had an experience four years ago and I just came out of that experience and decided, well, I had gotten stagnant in my life and I needed to change some things. How did you know what to change? Well, I knew I was overweight. I knew I needed to go to the gym. I knew I had not paid enough attention to my friends and my community. Mm -hmm. Because when this bad experience happened, all of a sudden all these friends were inviting me to dinner, you know, coming over to see me. They were, they were trying to take care of me. And what I realized was that they would invite me to their house in previous years and I'd always be, no, I'm sorry, I have to be in the studio. No, I have to be in New York. No, I have to be mm -hmm. working somewhere. And I just decided that, whoop, hold it, wait a second. <laughs> You're 50 years old. It's, mm. Tomorrow's today. Right, <laughs> right. Know, what are you yeah. waiting for to start? You know, so, so I made, I started, and, and they were my friends, and of course I was always friendly with them, but, but now I make time for them mm -hmm. in a way that I hadn't made time for before. But what do you think you've come to in your life philosophically when you say you're a different stage of, of life? Everyone has different stages. Everybody has different right. stages. What know? stage are you in now? Well, um, I'm, I'm in the one of trying to be I mean, I spent so much of my, of the last 23 years, and even before that, I just a very, and in the best sense of the word, ambitious person. Yes, you are. And so, hard and that's part of being, yeah, hard work, and that's part of being expansive, you know, I expect a lot from life. Um, and at this stage, what I'm also trying to do is enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design, Instead of having a graduate show at the school, I had a one-person show in New York. Mm -hmm. and, and I never stopped to, I never went to graduation because I was busy doing the next thing. How did that happen? How? That show in New York? Oh, I went, because when I, was, I went to graduate school at RISD in the second year, I put my slides under my arm and I went down and I started knocking on gallery doors. What was the worst thing they could say? No. Right, right. <laughs> okay. So I just, and I found a gallery and I had a show and I've had 18 one-person shows in New York since. Is that right? And oh, it was 18? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, something like that, 17, 18. So in the beginning, you have to really, of, of any career. Of any career. Right, you have to make that extra effort. You have to, and I think it's important if you can do something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's a big help. Find it, that's maybe the hardest thing for people is to I find the thing you're passionate about. Right. And then, you know, you go. And then if you're passionate about it, things will happen. You know, I have a friend who, who uh, a woman who's in her middle 40s, and she got divorced a few years ago, and she's trying to f find out what to do with her uh, career. And I said, well, what do you like doing? Right. You like working, you like cooking, you like working with food. Go to that. The right. money will come. She was selling real estate and hating it. Yeah. I said, don't stay there. Do you think you're passionate about more than one thing? Uh, yeah. I think that tends to be my personality. Uh, would you care to share worse. what they are? Well, uh, well, for example, I mean, you know, I go to the gym. I mean, I work at the gym lifting weights. I, I love doing it. Uh -huh. um, I went to Bhutan uh, two years ago, and we hiked. We did uh, 27,000 vertical feet in nine and a half days and 75 miles. And it was fabulous, and I can't wait to do something like that again. I mean, you know, I love to, I love to hike, I love to fish. I have a lot of uh, right. things I you know, love to I do, enjoy. get satisfaction. I love, that I get satisfaction from, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of hobbies. Right. I don't have a lot of things I kind of dabble in here and there, but I, but I have some things that I love to do, like, you know, hiking and stuff um, like that, being outdoors. What, what was your family? Food. Food, well, we can relate to that. I love, <laughs> I, you know, that's my, I, I, I do people, that's my only hobby is that I love to cook and I love to eat. Yeah, so. earthy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, really nice. Um, what sacred memories do you take forward with you from your mother or father? Oof. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting. Um, I, actually, the most, and when I think of sacred, I think of ritual. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I think that's, that's a big part of what makes something sacred is a ritual and how, right. the, how that ritual touches you. I mean, it could be your own personal ritual, whatever that shrine is to you, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a, re a religious, you know. Right. But my grandfather, uh, came here um, from Eastern Europe, and he was uh, Orthodox Jewish. And he prayed three times a day, mm. and in this very ritualistic way where he would wrap oh, himself right, yeah. with fill in. And, and uh, you know, that I never understood what that meant, because I always saw it growing up as a kind of religious activity. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I became an artist that I realized that what he was doing was putting himself into an uncommon place for the mm -hmm. day. That through his life, as he did whatever he did every day, those, those three moments in that day, he would put himself into an uncommon place, a sacred place for him. Mm -hmm. and. I realized that when I realized that making art had a similar feeling for me. That there are certain times when I draw or when I understand something in what I'm trying to do, that that's where I feel I can be in a kind of parallel place. Because, you know, my life as an artist is the phone rings, the, you know, I have to talk to my people who work for me. I mean, it's not just sitting there and, you know, the sun comes through the window and boom, I create. But when I do take those, that try to get to those places, mm. when I am being my most creative and most in touch with all of those parts, then that's when I feel like I've achieved the same kind of thing that I think my grandfather achieved. Which when is he, what, which when he dove it, when what, he prayed. Which, which is a, a sense of the universe. A sense of the universe, a sense of really being at peace, mm -hmm. a sense of being connected in a, in a very non-material way, mm -hmm. you know, in a very spiritual way. And how long does it take to do that? that? Do you remember? How long does it take for me to get Not there? Not you, or for him? your grandfather. Well, when you, you wrap well, it up. Oh, God, it would that, be probably about 45 minutes. Three times a day. Three times a day. Yes, and it was crucial to him. It was crucial to him, and I—it's such a vivid memory. 
And in fact, I, you know, in some of my work, I use these wrappings. Mm. And part of it is, is just a sense of that. And wrapping has a lot, has, um, you know, sacred connection in African art. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol of uh, the female when things are braided or wrapped. Mm -hmm. it, it, it goes very cross-cultural. It goes into, into Buddhism. So it's mm -hmm. a kind of cross, you know, religious. Contained. Yeah, this idea of wrapping and braiding. And so, uh, and, and then, so that's sort of my most kind of uh, sacred right. memory. I don't, it's a religious memory, it's a sacred memory. Well, what a wonderful. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Because it really did, I, finally it connected. You know, I mean, I watched him for years, and I was a kid, and I was kind of like, you know, I'm not really interested in this. And then... And he never explained it. Well, he explained He wished I would be religious, but oh, of course, okay. I was an American, right. uh, you know, whatever, 10-year-old. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do was that. You know, I mean, right. I grew up going to synagogue and, and stuff, but the last thing I wanted to do was that. I just saw it as a very old-fashioned kind of... Um, you, you know, way of being. Right. habit. Habit, you know, right. religious... A custom. Uh, yeah, a custom. A custom. And then, then, of course, as I said, you know, uh, quite a few years ago, I realized what it meant. You know, I mean, that's the other thing about getting older. You realize that these, these uh, rituals mm -hmm. are not necessarily what they seem. What they seem. You know, that's, I guess, part of getting older is you realize they have other meanings for people, not just the meanings that the religious organization attaches to them. Mm -hmm. So you saw more deeply. Absolutely. From your own experience. A absolutely. I, I'll tell you, another, uh, another experience, I don't know if you're any, well, you can always yeah. edit this out, but another really uh, moving moment for me was, as I said, my mother died when I was 13, and in, in uh, Jewish tradition, right. you, uh, someone in the family has to go to temple every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset mm -hmm. and say what's called mourner's Kaddish. Right. And that's a prayer that is a, really about the glorification of God. And it's got nothing, at the time, when I was 13, now my dad worked very hard and he was a carpenter. He left very early in the morning, came home very late at night. My brother was uh, in college in Colorado. So it fell upon me to do this. Mm -hmm. So for 11 months, I went every morning and every night. But there was a part of me that was like, why am I doing this? This isn't about my mother. This is about the glorification of God. Mm -hmm. That's what the prayer says. And several years ago, it hit me why that prayer, why you say that prayer. You say that prayer because it absolves you of feeling as if you had, there was something you could do about mm. this person's death. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, obviously at 13, many children when their parents die when they're young feel that well, somehow they are yes. connected to it. Right. And I think, I think what the Morris Cottage does for everyone is that when, if you give yourself up to this idea that there is some power in the universe that is, that you don't control everything mm -hmm. in the universe, mm -hmm. that there are acts that happen in the universe that are not within our control as humans, because we like to think we control everything, right? That 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 gives you the freedom to mourn without feeling guilty of right. the loss. Right. Uh, very interesting. Well, I thought it, it was really interesting to me that it was like, well, that's what this prayer is trying to do. It's trying to let you give up the idea that somehow you had a hand in this person's death. Hmm. And did it for you along the way, or you know, just we had to wait the eleven months? I had, well, I didn't figure that out till about four years oh. ago. Oh, isn't what caused you to figure it out then? I don't know. You know, I think I think again when all this stuff, this trauma sort of happened to me, and I just started, you know, relooking at my life, and right. I started rethinking about it. I mean, I carried, you know, my parents' death with me for a long time, mm -hmm. a long time. Right. Well, first of all, I just thought I wasn't going to live very long. Mm -hmm. I just right. thought by the time I was 30, I would be, and you know, my father died when he was, 50, excuse me, 54. Yeah. And I just turned 54, and that was like an amazing milestone. So I think just recently it started, you know, I, I needed to start to leave 
that stuff behind and not carry it around anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I guess that was like one of the one of the insights I had was, wow, that's what that prayer is about. Okay, now I can leave that behind. <laughs> right, it's like the light of understanding came to you. Yep. On that. Yeah, it was fascinating. Fascinating. Was fa you know, just fascinating. And and if you had asked me this five or six or seven years ago, I would have just said, Psh. <laughs> you did it right. I don't know. Out of respect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. It was interesting. All right. So those have been, you know, two sort of insights I've had in the more, you know, recent recent past. And, and uh, I don't know how they affect. You know, that's the other thing is being an artist is um, hopefully the work is greater than the sum of the parts. And uh, how things affect the way the work is, is not always known. It, it, it shouldn't be known. Mm -hmm. If it's all known, then, then it's the technique part. Then you could have the technique part, but not the other part if right. it's all known. I, I've always been um, a little mystified why people ask artists what their work mean. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, because I view it as an expression. Sure. But sure. Sure. what sure. am sure. I, uh, I mean, is that a valid question to be asked? What does it mean? Or what did you mean by it? Or what do you want people to walk away, away from? from? And yeah. all these kinds of questions I don't think are really very interesting. But. Well, I think Hans Hoffman said, um, something to the effect of, well, when you look at a beautiful tree, you don't ask, right. what does this tree mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that uh, you know, there's all, art has a broad range, and obviously contemporary art and modern art is very contextual. Mm -hmm. I mean, all art was contextual, whether it was, you know, the, the Romans sculpting the, the body and all of a sudden it's starting to leave the ground and become freestanding. I mean, there's all of it's contextual, but, but in particular, modernism mm -hmm. um, is very, you know, during the 60s we had pop art. Mm -hmm. So those things have sort of specific meanings to the culture. Um, the work that I make, well, here's what I would say. When I had my big uh, retrospective, which went to five museums in this country, uh, I didn't have any labels on the walls because I'm offended by the way museums are now. They're so didactic that you go in, the, the painting's this big, the label's that big. <laughs> right. People go, they look at the painting for about two seconds, they read right. the label for 30 seconds, they look at right. the painting again for two seconds, and then there's something in their ear that tells them what right. they're looking at. <laughs> yeah. I find that very offensive. So we had a map that you could pick up that you could carry around with you, and if you wanted to look at what the piece was titled, you could do that. But basically I wanted people to explain Explore the environment of the sculptures, and there were, I think, 30 sculptures and maybe 55 objects total, including drawings and things that I models and lots of stuff. And uh, and so then they would need to experience the work. At the end, there was a video and a book, and they could read about it, right. but not first. I mean, right. you don't really sort of need to go read about Beethoven before you go to the symphony, do you? No. You go in and you experience it. Right. And then if you want to educate yourself, you go and read. And then what would happen is I'd go meet with the docents. Right. And the docents would say to me, now they'd start to ask me, they'd say, now what should we say about this? Or what should I, and here was my take, I would say to them, here is what I would like you to do. I would like you to have whoever it is that you're taking around. I'd like you to bring them into the room. I'd like you to tell them to take 10 minutes or 15 minutes and look at the work and come back with three things that they feel or think about when they see the work. And that's the discussion you should have. That is something to carry with us everywhere in yeah. life. Yeah, that's... 
I want to thank uh, Howard for being with us today. We've uh, learned a lot from his sharing. We've learned to trust ourselves, his is in the area of art, that he tries to bring emotionality and spirituality into what he's doing. That while you can teach technique, you cannot really, um, you either have or you don't have that um, special communication that, it, that shows itself as an artist. Uh, that even if you graduate from really good schools, it's part salesmanship. You've got to always look ahead. And as he said, that before graduation ceremony, he already had a show in New York. Um, along the way, while well, he worked very hard and he had friends, it wasn't until something unfortunate happened in his life that he realized that he needed room for them and room for other experiences. So to his credit, he changed his life in several ways. His weight, his gym, his trips, his dinners. And this is really interesting because his parents died quite young, while well, he was quite young. And he is just past the age of the, uh, of the death of his father. But what really influenced him was his Orthodox Jewish grandfather, who prayed twice, uh, three times a day and was unfathomably um, loyal to that practice, but may know no meaning to, to uh, Howard. But when his mother died, he was the only one who had to go to, to services, which you have to do twice a day. And they talked about the universality of God. And he wasn't really clear about that till much later, and which he learned that it, it releases you from guilt. And the three um, prayers a day was his way of uh, communicating and experiencing the divine, which Howard experiences sometime in his work, which he mostly does in solitude. So thank you, Howard. Howard does not live here, but he does come visit occasionally. And when you see him, thank him. And remember, kindness counts. Please, please go out and do something nice for someone today that you know and someone you don't know. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Howard. Always my pleasure. <laughs> to share your comments and suggestions, contact Junior. The email address is juniordoan at aol.com or write to Post Office Box 169, Midland, Michigan, 48640.